Hello, everybody. I have Von Penn here with Black and Making It, Everything Arts and Education. We are so excited to have with us today Dr. Nadia Lopez, who is an award-winning educator who became a viral sensation after the popular blog Humans of New York featured her as one of their most influential people. Disrupting the school-to-prison pipeline, Dr. Lopez founded Mott Hall Bridges Academy, a STEAM focused middle school in Brownsville, Brooklyn, New York in 2010 and served as the principal for 10 years. She was named LinkedIn's 2019 Top 10 Voices in Education and received the Black Girls Rock Award alongside Michelle Obama in 2015. She works vigilantly to improve education disparities and her mission has been publicized across major media outlets including the New York Times, New York Post, Wall Street Journal, to name a few, and now Black and Making It. Dr. Lopez, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much for having me, Avon. I'm excited about this conversation. Uh, so am I. So am <laughs> I. You know, really interesting. I, I was really excited when I uh, learned about you and uh, your discussion and your work about disrupting the uh, school to prison pipeline. Uh, caught my attention um, as a theater artist and a theater professor. Uh, the piece uh, springs to mind Anna DeVere Smith's Notes from the Field because that particular piece takes a look at that. Um, so I'm excited to dig in a little bit deeper with that with you as an educator. So for those who may or may not be familiar with this, what exactly is the School to Prison Pipeline? Essentially it is all conditions that lead children into the prison pipeline because of the community being deprived of resources, quality education, quality health care, um, access to fresh produce. Um, you know, when we talk about the words like marginalized, disenfranchised, underprivileged, everything that has to deal with poverty mm -hmm. and not providing the necessities that allows for equity in communities, specifically those of color, black and brown children are suffering the most. We can talk about rural populations, but that's not what Black in the Making is about. Um, but essentially it's, it's, it is, I say the intentionality to ensure that communities of color where black and brown people live do not get what they need, which then creates this pipeline um, based out of despair, right? If you cannot survive, financially, if you don't have the means of having somewhere to live, um, if you don't have security, you take on activities that may be criminal um, or you make uh, decisions that essentially puts others in harm's way or yourself, which leads you into the criminal justice system. So our schools, unfortunately, um, do not get the resources that they deserve. Um, our children may not get the most qualified teachers, right? So you can have some exceptional teachers, but if we wanted to look at the totality of a school building, you're not mm -hmm. going to get, you're not going to get like a hundred percent of the teachers who are experienced, who know how to deal with the culture of where the community is located mm -hmm. and really understand the nuances of what it means to be a black child in America and trying to survive. Um, so yeah, those are the things. Related and to it. thank you for that detailed breakdown and explanation. So what do you have to say to people who feel like this really isn't a problem? Like I've heard arguments of, well, anybody can achieve or people make mm -hmm. it out of poverty every day and there's just no excuses. What do you have to say to those individuals? <laughs> So I'm going to be honest, I have those people in my family. <laughs> I have those people as friends. Um, and, you know, it's it's one of those things where this isn't about you. And I say that because those who are saying it are coming from a place of, I came from a, 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 um, a poor background and I made it, 
you know, I, I was able to come from a family of immigrants and I made it. And, and the reality is that you don't know the life of the child who I had to serve mm-hmm. um, and what they have to overcome, right? So whatever your coping mechanisms are, whatever um, opportunities you may have been given, whatever uh, a resilience that you have within you, God bless you. But there are young people who just don't have it. Um, and it's because of what they've been exposed to at home. It's generational poverty. Um, they don't have the means. They haven't seen anything different. And so it's not a matter of comparing yourself to what someone else's experience is. It's about understanding mm-hmm. what they're experiencing and then providing them with support if you can, right? Because oftentimes it's about like, you, you make the decision of whether or not a person is intentionally wanting to fail in life by having a conversation with them and understanding what happened. Now, there are individuals where you're like, Mm-mm, you, 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 you could do better. You're choosing not to. But there are some folks, there are circumstances that children are going through that adults would never want to go through in their lives. And because they don't have relationships, because they don't want to go into communities of color anymore, or you made it. And so now you don't go back because you made it. And so you forgot really what your life was really about when you were struggling and you wouldn't wish that on anybody else. You don't have a right to say anything about someone who is going through a hard time. I mean, at the end of the day, the question is, where's the empathy, right? Mm-hmm. Where, where's the compassion? Um, and judge each individual by their circumstances. Don't judge the totality of people um, based off of your personal success. Because whatever you learn, you should be sharing it with the next generation of folks so that they can be just as successful as you. Mm. So very true. So a part of uh, all what we're talking about now was a part of your inspiration for starting Mott Hall Bridges Academy, right? Mm -hmm. So can you just dig a little bit deeper into what that that moment was when you said, you know what, I see these issues, I want to tackle them. Not everyone goes, I'm going to start a school. Uh, so <laughs> can you just talk us through that, that pro- and one, I do want to just take a moment to celebrate you and all of your works that you have Thank you. achieved. Um, it's so inspirational, but yes, go ahead, please, and, and tell us about that. Well, I thank you for the acknowledgement and want to say that I initially did not want to be an educator. It wasn't something that I was ever interested in. Um, I actually have a nursing background, but that also helped me to become a better educator because there's a holistic approach you need to have when you're in education to see the whole child and not looking at them from a like in healthcare, we look at people from a diagnostic perspective, right? Like what is mm-hmm. their issue and how do we treat it? Nursing is asking the questions and finding out the behaviors that led to this health issue and then providing them with the resources, support, um, and a plan of how to prevent further you know, issues. Mm-hmm. Um, the same thing has to be said for education. Um, but I was actually inspired by my daughter. I um, had, a, at the time I was, after having my daughter, I remember just thinking to myself, I want to be, I want to be where she's at. And I thought about who were the individuals who inspired me outside of my parents and immediately what came to mind were teachers. And mm-hmm. what was discouraging is that many of my colleagues couldn't tell me about good uh, examples of schools that their children were in. Or the fact that they didn't know the teachers, like when we were growing up, we knew who our fifth and sixth grade teachers were. Like we look forward to them because they had been in the school for so long. They had like a reputation. Mm -hmm. And nowadays in schools, you're lucky if a teacher stays three to four years. And so um, I was just like, I want to, I want to become a teacher. But once I got into the public school, um, system as an educator and not as a student, I got to see how broken it was. I got to see how, you know, the disparities lived out in in communities and also how within a school of predominantly Black children that may be led by a predominantly Black administration created marginalizations within the school, which was to me like how 
how do we further separate children when everybody in here is black and brown? Like, how do we do that? But it became the have and have nots. And so I found that to be problematic because the difference between a child excelling is one self-efficacy where they believe it, mm-hmm. but they have to be reminded that they can be who we see them to be, right? And so if they're coming from a household where all they see is the negativity in their neighborhoods and they're never praised, they're never reassured, um, and then they come into a school building where they're treated as though they're never going to achieve, they're never going to you know, amount to getting a high school diploma or going to college, everything surrounding them just speaks to where you can't go. And oftentimes children, when they go to schools, it's the one place that they feel like they are seen and heard. And um, when I was in in, in the school buildings that, the, cause I, I, before opening a school, I worked in three buildings. I saw the difference between when teachers really love children and poured into them and made no excuses about their zip codes or circumstances as it related to them actually being able to achieve, it spoke volumes to, there is an an intentional um, focus to keep a group of young people. And when I say a group of young people, if you're not high achieving, if you're not the gifted and talented, if you're not the Jack and Jill kid who's connected to somebody, then they don't see you as an asset. If you come from the projects, if you're low income, if you get free or reduced lunch, then you probably come from a criminal background or you'll become a criminal yourself. So let's not waste any more time, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get placed in the bottom class. And by getting placed in the bottom class, you get the teachers who don't have the experience or don't have the classroom management or don't know how to teach anybody anything. And so you perpetuate this child going through a track of insignificance, and not being able to see themselves as an achiever. So I can I can it's I can, it didn't settle well with me to sit there and watch this happen. Mm-hmm. Um so I became a founding teacher of an all girls school and I really love that. But I missed the boys. I missed the fact that um our girls in one regard the school that I was in didn't really understand the complexities of black girls, black and brown girls, and often saw their behaviors as problematic as opposed to, no, this is just what, (laughs) this is just like what we go through. You know, the hair isn't looking the way it wants to, the body is starting to change. They're going through their cycles and don't really know, you know, the menstruation and attitudinal behaviors, like all of these things that just sit down and talk to the girl and you'll understand what, what she's experiencing. Or the ones who are going through identity um, trying to figure out who they are. And so I found myself coaching people who are not of color, who are leaders of the school, how to deal with us. And I was like, this is problematic. But on the flip side, I was like, I need to also have, I like a co-ed space because while we can focus on the girl who's, who, who's focusing on our young men and mm-hmm. They need to coexist just for my personal experience. I wanted them to coexist. Um, So I decided to create a a STEAM focused or at the time a STEM focused proposal, which would become Mott Hall Bridges Academy Um, because I just felt like it's not about saving one gender as opposed to the other. It's about saving our community. And I don't want to put it in a savioristic way. It was just a matter of seeing the brilliance that I know exists without compromising um, our children by making them commodified products of the public school system. Mm -hmm. All all the things. So (laughs) (laughs) as you were talking, you uh, leaned into what was going to be my next question. So uh, yes, what made you decide to transition from simply STEM to STEAM? And what value do you feel that arts brings to the educational picture? You know, what made me change it to STEAM was that our children aren't taught the value of the arts. And 
we are the creator of the culture. Visual arts, performing arts, it's inherent <laughs> that we are dancers, we are creatives, we are builders, all of these things. And yet what we create, again, is commodified in pop culture. Yet we're not taught that we are the ones of which this began. And so I wanted them to own and embrace being an artist because mm -hmm. when we go to various museums, our works are not the first thing we even we ever see, right? There's always a mm -hmm. lot of impressionist work. There's always um, just new age work, but it's not, it's not geared towards us. And when it is geared towards us, it's a special exhibit. I wanted our kids to be surrounded by art all over the building. I wanted them to um, learn drumming. I wanted them to learn dance. I wanted them to act. I wanted them to sing. I was creating the next version of fame, right? But not making it a fame school because I also did not want to create a school that was so specialized that kids didn't get anything else. I wanted, I wanted children who didn't think that they were artists to see that they could be artists. I wanted children mm -hmm. who didn't believe that they could hold a note to learn how to sing, right? And how to hold, like understand the chords. Like it was important for me to set them, you know, sit them in front of individuals who saw their value. And you would never imagine that these young people would become dancers same kids who came in awkward were going to performing art schools for dance. Um, they were now becoming visual artists that we were selling their paintings to people. Um, they were becoming um, music producers. Like they literally learned music production and then partnered with each other. And so they created their own tracks. And then we taught them entrepreneurship so that they can learn how to sell these things on their own. Because again, they came from um, a community that was impoverished. And I was just like, how are we allowing them to con continuously live as though they cannot make an income off of the things that they see as a hobby, but someone else in another community of another culture is taught like, no, you could sell that. You could sell that on eBay. You can sell that on Etsy. You can like, they, they're taught this. So mm -hmm. no, I decided to be intentional um, because STEM is part of the arts anyway, right? There's a science to dancing. There's a science to visual art. Um, there's technology that's incorporated. There's the engineering of things and there's a mathematical way of looking at stuff. So it all just made sense. Well, it sounds like a part of that integration for you, as I call it, well, other people may say this as well, but taking inventory, like mm -hmm. realizing what you already have and just learning how to work it. Exactly. And in art, uh, famously gives confidence, uh, gives confidence. And it's just, I find also a healthy outlet as well. Um, for me, art was always a way to cope with a challenging situation. Um, for me, that was writing. I was always doing some kind of dance. Um, my father was a visual artist. So, you know, I grew up with his paintings in the home and, and this and that. And, um, uh, and I would draw, but all, all of the different things are, um, and they're a way to connect as well, which is so Absolutely. very important and a means for perpetuating narratives that otherwise would not be heard, whether that narrative come through visual art or through music or through performance or writing. Um, so uh, really loved that 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 shift whoop, did did come. And as you do mention, STEM is is a part of all of these things as, as well. And as you said, the narrative, it's it's. The arts tells our stories. That's how we keep it going, right? No matter what, it continuously tells our story of where we're from, who we are. It's tribal, it's all of those things. And so the beauty of it 
I just, I was like, no, we're going from STEM to STEAM. And I could do that because it's the school I started. <laughs> so that's why. <what. laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. So uh, let me see what else did I have here. So in 2020, you stepped away from your role as principal with Mott Hall Bridges Academy. Um, you speak of due to stress-related illness and to focus on your mental health. And I think it's really cool that you're very open about this and talk about it. And it's a part Part of a big part of what you focus on now. Um, so, uh, you know, bearing in mind that these last few years have been taxing for a whole lot of people and a lot of people are um, dealing with uh, mental health challenges, what advice do you have for people trying to balance the demands of work with um, mental health and well being? You have to be intentional. I, I honestly, I'm going to say this because I've been through it. Um, I don't believe that there is a way of finding balance when you're in positions of service. Um, it's just really, really hard because there's constantly a need and that's why we're in service of, right? So you think about the pastor, you think about the, the nurse, the doctor, um, educators, social workers, you're constantly helping someone who's in need. And so just personally, we don't know how to cut that off, right? We, we've, and we inherently learned that from our parents and our grandparents, we've seen them do it. Um, you have to though create boundaries and that's really hard, but you have to create boundaries. And what's interesting is that when there are people in our lives who say, no, we get offended. Cause it's a hard no, like, no, <laughs> like, wait, you're not gonna, <laughs> no. I'm not. And then they don't give you an explanation. And you're like, tag, because you would formulate a reason why, because you feel so bad. And this person is like, I need to preserve myself. So the answer is no. And their no is I don't, I can't do it right now. I need to prioritize myself or I don't have to, but whatever way it is, is that they've made an executive decision that this is where I can, I'm drawing the line and I don't have to move forward and explain anything to anyone else. You have to say to yourself, I need to be well. And what does wellness look like? And you have to define that. Wellness looks like rest. Wellness may look like taking uh, walks, right? Around the park. Wellness may look like going to the spa. Wellness may look like taking two days to get away. Wellness may look like you just sitting in your car for 30 minutes and just having solitude to yourself, right? Now I want you to do more than that, but wellness has to start with you defining it. And if you don't know what that looks like, then you need to speak to someone in that wellness space because we deprive ourselves. I got really, really sick to a point that I almost lost my life because of the work, the demands of the work, being in a toxic school environment in terms of not my school, but the school system, right? It was not concerned about what I had to pour into maintaining the school the way it was and not only being there for children, but being there for the adults, whether it was my staff, whether it was the parents, because the parents needed more than the children sometimes, um, and always having to be present at places, because when you're a leader, you become a community leader. And so you have to attend different things. And then I was also a mom. And then I'm a daughter of someone who's a senior. So there were demands on me constantly. But what I wasn't doing was getting enough rest because I had developed insomnia. What I wasn't dealing with was my own anxiety and depression because the anxiety of constantly thinking about what do I need to get to and what how much time I don't have and um, you know who's going to be coming to my building and all these things. And then the depression of it just never feels like I have enough time. It doesn't never feel like we're moving enough. It's never, I never feel successful. So it becomes this vicious cycle. Mm -hmm. And then I dealt with panic attacks. But all of this ultimately affected my physical health. And it's interesting because we hear about how stress kills, but no one really tells us how stress shows up in ways that we wouldn't even imagine. So I developed two autoimmune disease, one of which was a kidney disease 
that the doctors could not figure out for a long time because it was just like you don't have any of the what we would say prerequisites or prefactors. I didn't have high blood pressure. I didn't have diabetes. I didn't have cholesterol. I didn't have a history of kidney disease. So what like it wasn't until they did a biopsy and then had to run two tests on my cells before they even determined that something was wrong. Um, and you know what it came down to? It was not getting enough sleep, not going to the bathroom like I need to, just drinking coffee all day, reheating the coffee, and then taking uh, uh, inhibitors for my stomach because I was having bad acid reflux that turned into isophilic esophagitis. So essentially the acid reflux causes your esophagus to seem like a foreign object. The white blood cells started to attack my esophagus. And so the only thing that would help was the medication that the doctors prescribed. So you start off with like Rolaids and then you go to Prilosec and Nexium and all these things. I actually had to get a prescribed medication. What no one told me and the doctors weren't paying attention is and they're the ones prescribing it, is that you're supposed to take these things six weeks at a time. I took it for six years, mm. right? And it was because in order for me to deal with the stress of work, I had to take this medication. And so once I developed the disease, I had to take a year and a month off. And it came down to, it came right before COVID. And then during COVID, I was still, I was on medical leave, but I was still doing an excessive amount of work to support those teachers who were teaching the scholars because they were teaching live. And then when I went to get my labs done, it showed that I was regressing. And the doctors were like, what are you doing? Are you fasting? What, what's happening? Because there's a dramatic change that's showing up on your labs. And I was like, oh, you know, I'm home, I'm online with the kids and, and the teachers. And, and they're like, so you're not eating or go to the bathroom. I was like, you know, I forget I'm so into it. And they were like, mm. so the, I remember the doctor saying to me, like, I, I thought, you know, it was an over-exaggeration on your part that how much it's required for you to do your work. But he was like, we're in a pandemic and you're home on a medical leave and you're literally regressing. You're going to go back to work and I'm going to tell you your three options. You're going to end up with kidney dialysis. You're going to end up having to get a kidney transplant or you're going to die an early death, which you need to prepare for because there's no other way of looking at it. And that kind of was just like, I have no other option left um, because I'm also raising a young black woman, right? To follow in my footsteps. And what I'm showing her is that you literally kill yourself for a job that's not going to mourn you when you're gone. And as much as I love my kids, as much as I love my staff, the system didn't love me enough to protect me from what I was experiencing. And so um, I ended up resigning um, and have not looked back since. So do tell us about what you're doing now with the Lopez effect. I'm kind of jumping out of order of my questions, okay. but it seems like the perfect segue. Um, so now with the Lopez effect, what I do is, you know, I've had the honor of coaching women of color in leadership, and it's mm -hmm. been really, really um, a blessing because what I've experienced, I help them to navigate their leadership um, by centering wellness and prioritizing themselves in order to be effective to do the work, but also recognizing when a place is not honoring you and you don't have to subject yourself to toxicity that is not going to help you um, in any way, shape, or form. So I've been able to do that. I've also consulted with um, various companies around social impact, as well as working with districts just to get themselves aligned to meeting um, the needs of children and putting in you know, practices that are going to be sustainable. But I also love doing my podcast, which is um, detention that challenges um, what's happening in education by engaging in courageous conversations um, and speaking. I love speaking across stages around the world, as well as visiting various schools um, globally, because education is not just in your backyard. It exists everywhere and the problems are consistent um, and we just need to really engage in conversations 
about it from that perspective um, so that we can really create a cohesive model around the world. Yes, all the things. Okay, mm -hmm. well, um, we'll get to the, when we get to uh, our conclusion, love to have you share how people can follow you and keep up with you and what you're up to. I'd like to step back a little bit back into um, the school setting. I was super moved by your acceptance speech for Black Girls Rock, and also mm -hmm. just checking out some of your other interviews, you know, do, do my research and everything. Uh -huh. um, and one thing that you mentioned that stood out to me was the need for parent involvement in the lives of students. Um, this may have stood out to me for a few reasons. I've heard my own mom talk about this. I come from a family of educators. Um, my great aunt was the first Black superintendent of Cattle Parish, I think is, is mm -hmm. how that mounts down to. She was the first Black um, principal in that area um, and so forth. And so education was real. And she was the, I think the first of her family members to go to college and um, her family, they, they had a farm or, you know, a few crops here and there and an animal here and there, and they sold hogs to get the money to help send her to school. So education is very deeply ingrained in um, the trickle down mm -hmm. in, in my family. Um, so I remember, and my mother worked in education as a, since I was a kid and she wanted to have the same schedule that I would have, um, uh, she did substitute work, um, in my childhood years and one, and sometimes a few times extended assignments where she would be with a group of students for a long, well, mm -hmm. that would be a long-term assignment, um, and she would note how there would be a disparity in our parents coming through for our children, mm -hmm. comparatively speaking, and how it was just so different for her because when she was growing up, parents were always there for mm -hmm. everything, big or small. As you mentioned, knowing the teachers, she talks about my grandfather putting on his suit to go down to the school to, you know, talk with whoever, you know, whatever parents, meetings, whatnot. And mm -hmm. so it would just concern her. And then for me to hear you talk about that, parents, we need you to be there every step of the way, not mm -hmm. just at graduation, not just at the end goal, why do you why do you think this is something that um, is a struggle within the black community? That's not to say that there aren't it doesn't happen yeah. in other races. I'm not saying that, but there's definitely a thing in the black community. Why why do you think that is? I I don't know. I just think like there's a culture of comfortability that's um very concerning. Because I would tell my parents all the time, the parents of the scholars that I had, you know, I appreciate y'all trusting me, but y'all are not supposed to trust me to the extent that you don't show up for anything, mm -hmm. right? Because in this, in this system, they will do unto your children what you allow. And so when you don't show up, you don't know anything that's happening or why it's happening. Hence the reason why so many parents were taken aback when COVID happened. And they were like, why are you learning this? <laughs> what is this? And what's happening? And it's just like, that's because you, you haven't been anywhere. You haven't been to the school. You don't know the curriculum. You haven't asked any questions. You don't look at your child's book. You literally let them come home from school. They're safe. They're good. Did you learn something? Yes. Keep it moving. That's not how it's supposed to go. And, it, and it's oftentimes because that's unfortunately what they learned from their parent, mm -hmm. right? My parents aren't from this country. My mother and my father, both of them did not have a formal education in terms of they didn't graduate high school. They didn't go to college. Um, my mom might have like a sixth grade education. My dad, the most is ninth grade. But they understood that education was really, really important. And the only reason why they didn't continue school is because of their life circumstances. They had to start working at a very young age because my mom lost her father at a very young age. Um, and my dad 
he he was the he was a man of a house, so he had to work. Um, and so ultimately, when I went to school, my mother went to every school meeting from the time I was in. First off, she put me in a very Afrocentric independent school. So it was a African independent school. Um and it's not like African, the culture, it's an African-American school mm-hmm. where they taught you about who you were, mm-hmm. what your relationship was to this country, what your relationship was just in general in this on earth. Um, so I was, t- I was, I was embedded with knowing that I had value, but my mom went to every PTA meeting. She would volunteer. I, she, it didn't matter what school building I was in. She did this for elementary school she knew every teacher she had a phone number attached to them she would come up to the school when she had days off she would volunteer her time and you know like assembly everybody had to have a white shirt my mom would be the one to go and buy extra white shirts so we would all have white shirts so we could get an, a little accommodation card right um mom you know when I went to junior high school and then even in high school and I was like ma I'm in high school she was like I don't care I'm still going. And I live in Brooklyn and the school was in Harlem and she would have me get on the train. And I was like, I I don't want to go. And she was like, but you're coming. Because to her, I need to know what's going on. I don't want to know last minute. I want these people to know that you're my child. You're my only child. No, I don't trust anybody. I need to know. And so when I became a parent, I was the same way. I was up at every school meeting. And if I couldn't go, I would send my mother. So I would tell my, the parents, I said, listen, you may have a work schedule that is not convenient for you. You may have a lot of children that you have to meet all of their needs. And I get it. But if you can't go, you assign all these godmothers and godfathers. I need to see somebody. There's auntie and uncles. I need to see somebody. If there's a grandma, grandpa, I need to see somebody because here's what's going to happen on graduation day. The week before, you're going to come to me and say, Dr. Lopez, can I get an extra ticket? And I'm going to say, did the person come in your absence? And if you tell me no, then they can't come. And I have a right to reserve that because my entire team and I had to become a surrogate parent to your child every single day. And when you didn't show up, we still had to show up. So no, people don't just get to show up for the graduation and get to enjoy the festivities and they didn't have anything to do with how this child got here. I'm smiling because this sounds just like conversations I have with my mom now. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're right. Um, Mm -hmm. my, mom tells stories of my, my aunt that I was, my great aunt that I was telling you about, um, would call my grandfather, my mom's dad and say, you need to go up to the school and see about the girls and what they're doing and what they're going on. My grandparents were involved and made sure that my, you know, mom and aunt did what they needed to do. They're both college graduates and so forth and so on. And us litter of grandchildren were all, you know, so it, it did what it needed to do. She planted the seed. Great, great aunt Mildred planted yeah. the seed and everything did, did what it needed to do. But um, exactly the, you need to know, it's mm-hmm. important to know. Um, and you're right. Then, then people come up with questions later and it's, well, did you pay attention to this that was sent home or that, or um, come to the school for this or that? Um, I remember being inducted into the National Honor Society in high school. It was me and one other black girl were the only black people being inducted mm-hmm. um, at a PWI. And uh, I remember my mom being so moved that my unofficial Aunt Deb came to support Aunt Deb was no kin to me. (laughs) She went to church (laughs) with us. And one day she just scooped me up and I was hers. And my good friend belonged to her husband, Aunt Deb and Uncle Melvin. And so when I, you know, was having this moment, they they wanted to come and support. Um, Now, granted, that is an in-product thing, but um, just that sense of community for 
the young people in a family or in a community to know that we have the support of our elders. There's, mm -hmm. I also remember you mentioning at some point that your parents accept uh, expected nothing less than greatness from you. And yeah. so one of my questions for you is, or you, I guess you may have kind of touched on that, but what did that mean for you in your educational drive to where you are now? So, you know, it's interesting because my parents didn't have a, um, a ceiling. And what I mean by that was I never got a high school ring simply because I knew I had to go to college. And for me personally, I just didn't get a high school ring because my journey wasn't going to stop. And I didn't want to be satisfied with achieving that. So mm -hmm. the expectation was like, you're going to go to college. You're going to get a job. Now, the only thing I would say is that my parents are like, my mom specifically is like, oh, you get a good job with benefits and you should be, you should be excited and happy. Right. Whereas my dad is like, no, you probably going to have five or six jobs before you figure out what you want to do. And it's okay. Right. My mom is more the stable. My dad is more the creative, like, eh, why? We don't have to do that. And he's a photographer. So he's all about keep it moving. Um, but I, I just, I honestly will say that they, in our household, there was never an expectation of anything less. And I try to explain that to people who are not from our community or our culture, when they often say this, these blanketed statements, like, why don't they want more? Why don't they just leave their neighborhood, right? And when they talk about the they, you've already removed yourself from the experience of which you cannot understand. You can't empathize with why a person doesn't leave the projects or why this person doesn't see receiving public assistance as a form of slavery, right? Because they don't know anything different. We have to change conversations. So the way I structured the school for the scholars was, there are no limits. You're supposed to go. I didn't, I didn't make sure I didn't tell all of them they had to go to college. You got to be good at something. If you don't want to go to college, I'm okay with that, but be exceptional at the things that you do. So if you want to do something with your hands, you want to go into carpentry, be exceptional at that. You want to do computers, be exceptional at that. Don't don't minimize or shortchange yourself because literally there are people who are plumbers, electricians, who have their own business, who are doing it considerably better than a lot of educators or well-known people that you know, they have a skill that no one could ever take away from them, right? So what we gave to them was this confidence and this ability to believe that they were worthy and that they had to define what worth looked like. It wasn't about your status. It wasn't about a title because I will always tell the scholars, all of that can be taken away, but your intelligence and your skills cannot. And if you have those things, you can go anywhere in this world. But if you stick to a title, if I stick to only being Principal Lopez, then that means I can never go anywhere else and decide to be something else if there's nothing there to be a principal. Like I limit myself. So I call myself an educator because I can educate in health, right? I can educate within the tech company. I could be educated in any industry. How do you define what success looks like for you? How do you define what the what it means to you to live within your passion? Um, and so I, I appreciate and value my parents for that because I never knew how not to think about what my next steps were gonna be. And I see that with my daughter, like, it was a no brainer. She was like, you know, I knew I was going to go to college. I wasn't going to pressure her in terms of what she was going to study. Cause I believe you got to figure that out for yourself. But, um, that's something that I've passed down to her. And I, I, I made sure I did that with all the children who I led. Absolutely. What does black in making it mean to you? What does it mean to be black in making it? I mean, it's to be exceptional. It is to, for me personally, it is disrupting the status quo and what many have um, seen as a stereotype that to be black is to be inferior. I, I feel like to be black is to be exceptional, right? We come from 
a lineage of folks who have endured more than most. And we are still here, right? We are still in existence of that legacy. And no, I don't want to take on all the all the continuous having to work as hard. But the reality is that what we have within us allows us to continuously create, cultivate, and 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 shift the game. And that's beautiful because not other people can say that, right? We we always set the bar, and people are always chasing us and seeing what we're doing next. We don't commodify, literally, we don't commodify anyone. Everyone is always commodifying us. So to be making it um, for me has been disrupting the school to prison pipeline, teaching our next generation that they're exceptional, but also in this moment, ensuring that women of color in leadership do not sacrifice themselves and become martyrs to do the work that they need to get done. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Well, at this juncture, how can folks keep up with you, see what you're doing, your podcast, do tell? They can find me on all social media platforms under the Lopez Effect. So it's at the Lopez Effect, whether that's LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, mm-hmm. Twitter, even YouTube, it's all at the Lopez Effect. Um, and they can also find my podcast or uh, detention um that's the title of it on spotify apple or anywhere you stream your podcast it is available and ready to be heard awesome well before uh I'm going to tell the audience goodbye, but don't skedaddle just quite yet. Um, But those of you tuning in to Black and Making It, thank you so much for tuning in. You can follow us on social media at Black and Making It. Uh, No G on the making. Uh, And you can also uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel at blackandmakingittv.com. Until next time, everybody, uh, have a wonderful day. Ba-da-ba-da-bum Ba-da-ba-da-bum